Princess, um, are you okay? Oh, if it isn't the princess. Are those dark circles under your eyes from a romantic night out? Hmm? Oh! You were out with someone last night? No, they are from being woken up early by Dolora to do chores. Dolora grins at me from the other side of the bar, but says nothing as she goes back to a conversation with another boarder. Darling, you are no fun at all. You must tell me what happened last night. Last night? Did you like the bouquet? Oh, it was your idea for the flowers. Well, thank you, Claude. That was very romantic. How do you know about the bouquet? Why, because it was my suggestion. When Chevalier was asking Karma for advice, it was about me? Uh, look at the way she smiled, Anise. Last night must have gone well. I'm confused. What happened last night? I'm going to get Rumpel to give me all of the juicy details when he comes downstairs. That is Chevalier to you. Chevalier appears behind Karma, smiling. He seems a lot calmer today than usual. He glances over Karma at me and we catch each other in a silent gaze. Seeing his eyes reminds me of last night, which makes me inadvertently flush. Chevalier just winks at me. Chevalier? What is that? Something you say when a person sneezes? <laughs> <laughs> Don't judge, Claude. No, that's his name. Rumpel, that is Chevalier, broke his curse yesterday. There is stunned silence from everyone in the immediate area. Even Dolora walks over to us. That's true, I didn't actually think about that. His curse is completely, uh... overturned now. He's free. Free to go if he wants to. So it's interesting, the... Original Rumpel Stiltskin story was about a king who was very greedy and selfish. And uh, Rumpel's problem was that he was too giving. So giving to the point of being selfish. Very interesting. What's this about a broken curse? Was it you, Rumpel? He's going by something that sounds like a fancy cake. <laughs> Parfait seems to be bursting with excitement. Though she is her usual calm self on the outside, I can tell by the bounce in her step and by the way she raises her voice to make an announcement that she is proud. When everyone has learned that Chevalier has broken his curse, people come to the table offering drinks and congratulations. Chevalier gets lost in the crowd, mostly of women. But much to my surprise, Chevalier does not flirt back with any of them. Aww. And then, in between our celebrations for Chevalier, the front door to the marchin opens and Waltz rushes inside. Oh dear. It was the calm before the storm. Things were going way too well. We were already in an established romantic relationship. Rumpel's curse is broken before any shenanigans have even happened. And I'm like, this is... This is great and all, but something's gonna happen. Uh, okay, Waltz. Lay down the news. Where are Dolores and Lady Parfait? I need to speak to them immediately. Waltz, you're just in time. We're all... Something has happened at the palace. The room goes quiet at Wallace's proclamation. A few people shift uneasily in their chairs. Some try to go back to conversation. Most people do not care what happens in the palace, but they can tell by the tone of Wallace's voice that it is bad. What's happened at the palace? An uprising. Uh, wh what A coup staged by witches. Witches have taken over the palace. Witches? In the plural? The information is so sudden it makes me dizzy. I reach out to grab the table and my hand lands on the wood before I can slip. Witches have taken over the palace? An army of them? No, only a few. Jurian strides across the room, followed quickly by Garland. What's this about witches taking over? We have some of the best knights at the palace! There's no way witches could break in under the palace's guard. Unless they had someone inside helping them. Ugh. Alcaster? No, Myth. Who are we talking about? You know him as Mithros. He uses a different name now. Wow, he really went undercover. I mean, Myth, Mithros, completely different names would never have made the connection between the two. Sir Mithros, the king's advisor? He's a witch? There is no way Mithros is a witch. We would have known. Glamour. 
He used the glamour. Everything Walt says suddenly gets swallowed up in questions. Okay, so he is the one that Walt thought was dead. I wonder why. Jerrion and Garland ask question after question, while others start surrounding Walt to ask him what has happened to the king and his children. I try to step closer to listen, but I cannot hear over the frantic voices in the room. Sir Mithros. I never trusted him, but I never thought he would be a witch. The room only quiets down when Delora and Parfait come to punctuate the conversation with their own demands for everyone to give Walt space. Let's get some answers, shall we? The march and boarders are all taken into the reception room, where Walt stands at attention, waiting to answer questions. He explains that he was looking into a rumor about Sir Mithras from only a few days ago, when he found out about the witch's uprising. It was a surprise attack orchestrated by Mithros, who let the witches in through a secret entrance to the palace. Alcaster was killed during the uprising. Many knights were injured and are currently being tended to in clinics and hospitals around the town. Man, this whole uprising thing plays out so differently in each route. In the first one, it was like nipped in the bud uh, by Mithros turning on Alcaster at the last moment. In the second one, Alcaster killed Mithros and he succeeded in his coup. And it was him and his uh, knight, the knights loyal to him, that took over the palace. And, and this one, he's the one that gets killed. <laughs> And Mithros has these witches come in to throw, overthrow the king. This is so completely nuts, though, but I love it. After his explanation, I feel even worse than I did in the main room. I stare at Waltz at a loss. What a Fritz. Fritz? Sir Alcaster's son. Fritz Gerald. He was my personal knight. If Sir Alcaster was killed during the uprising, where did that put Fritz? Poor Fritz, he died last time. Was he working with Sir Alcaster or with Sir Mithros? Did he escape? I'm sorry, Princess. I haven't heard anything about a knight named Fitzgerald. Was he... killed? The thought makes my heart plummet. No, Fritz could not possibly be dead. I have to believe that he is still alive. I feel Chevalier's hand on my shoulder, briefly, before it slides off. Are any of the king's knights remaining in the palace? If they are, then they've either been forced to turn against the king, or they've been killed. Is Mithros sitting on the throne? No, he usurped the king, but hasn't taken his throne. Waltz turns to me and his expression softens. Princess, feel free to ask me whatever you want. I'm sorry I didn't answer all your questions earlier. Oh my. I have so many questions, but I suppose I will ask them one at a time. Okay. Yeah, I want to know all these things. I guess we'll just start at the top and work our way down. So, what has happened to the king and the others? I'm not sure. From what I've heard, the king and his family, your family, are still alive. I never cared for any of my step-family, but hearing that they are okay is still a relief. Thank goodness Rod's still okay. Mithros may be keeping them prisoner for now. Hmm. Alright, what is the glamour that Sir Mithros used? Dolores steps in to answer the question. A glamour is a high-level magic used to conceal one's identity. It keeps even other witches from sensing you. Parfait ca cast the same magic on you shortly after you came to the tavern. It was to protect you from the evil witches. Uh. A glamour can only be conjured by the powerful witches. It sounds as if this witch has been using glamour to hide himself from others. Hmm. Do you know Mithros? It was a long time ago. We both shared the same teacher. Teacher? Wait. Waltz, are you a... A witch, yeah. He smiles at me, but it is weak and does not reach his eyes. Meth was always very competitive. I thought that he had died at the end of the Great War, but he's been in the palace this whole time. His disguise is so simple. I should have realized his name was so similar, but... Yeah! Okay, it's the glamour. <laughs> Doesn't make you think about it. You couldn't have helped it. That's what the glamour does to you. 
Maybe if I wasn't cursed. If I had more of my magic, I would have been able to sense him. Hmm. I wonder if their teacher was Hildur by any chance. Because Mithras is very dedicated to Hildur. Or was, I should say. So who's claimed the crown? As of right now, no one. The king's been kicked off of the throne. And Mithras has made a public announcement about usurping the throne, but he does not call himself king. Is he trying to win the throne over for someone? Myth has no one left. He was obsessed with our teacher, but she is... gone. Maybe he has different alliances now. Hmm. Parfait's eyes look distant as she stares dismally down at the ground. If my curse were broken, I would charge in right now and destroy him. Waltz's expression becomes so dark, it sends a shiver through me. It doesn't like Waltz to look so angry. We need to come up with a plan. Even if you weren't cursed, you would still not be able to defeat Mithros when he has other witches with him. Witches are... trickier to handle. Can't just be plunged through with a sword, eh? I agree with Karma. If all of us go in with swords and shields, we should be able to take the palace back. This is what we've been practicing for. Practicing? Oh, I'm so sad Lucette doesn't have her uh, sword fighting skills anymore. Even witches will die if you stick a sword through their heart, won't they? But getting to a witch who knows you're there is difficult. I must do something. I'm not going to ask is there anything I can do to help. I want to help. Chevalier wraps his fingers around my wrists and frowns. Princess... This whole time I have been living at the Marchen. I was spared the fate of the royal family by sheer coincidence because I was cursed. I cannot just sit here and do nothing while the kingdom falls to a witch. It fell to witches before and there were dire consequences. I cannot continue to be passive. I... I will not let myself be like mother. Princess, it's... I am Lucette Riella Brighton, the crown princess of Angiel, and I will not stand by and watch when the kingdom is in turmoil. The room goes quiet at my statements. Chevalier's fingers loosen on my hand. I can see a ghost of a smile on his face, though it underlies his sorrow. <laughs> Aw. Spoken like a true princess. Whether or not you want to help, princess, you really can't. You won't be able to use magic until your 18th birthday. That's when you become the bearer. I cannot let that stop me. I will find a way. The conversations in the room continue for a long while. At some point, it is said that volunteers are needed at the hospitals and clinics for the injured sh soldiers. Chevalier immediately volunteers. Oh yeah, you'll be perfect for that. Only afterward does he look at me with regret. Princess, I'm sorry. For what? For putting my job before you. And after all I just said. He told me he was going to try his best to change. Bria called him selfless before for putting his work before her, but... You would be a fool not to. Uh... My life is not in any danger, and there are people who need you more than I do. Do what you do best, Chevalier. Princess Lucette. I promise you, I will do whatever I can to help you as well. As the meeting disbands, I am left standing there in quiet. The last to leave is Waltz, who promises me that he will make things right. I am going to trust everyone, but I am also not going to stand idle. I will make things right somehow. Gotta make plans. As is my responsibility as Crown Princess. Bravo! Bravo! Chapter 9, The Witch Puppet. We're not even at the last chapter yet, my goodness. Ah, oh, another long night. The two of us are on our way back to the march and after visiting a clinic in town. We were there for hours, and it is a relief to be out in the open now, where I can feel the wind on my skin. Are you okay, princess? I know that what you saw must have been difficult. I'm sorry I couldn't shield you from the majority of it. I volunteered to help Chevalier at the clinic part-time, but it is worse than I had expected. Many of the soldiers have severe wounds. I had thought that most of the injuries sustained by the knights during the upheaval were only minor. But I was wrong. Their injuries are much worse. Princess? He reaches out and laces his fingers through mine, then gives me a soft smile as he squeezes my hand. 
Are you okay? I'm fine. It has only been one day since the uprising at the palace. I had thought that there would be less blood. I was wrong. Is this what things were like after the Great War? I wasn't a fully certified doctor after the Great War, but I was an assistant. It was far worse than this, Princess. We cannot have a repeat of the Great War. I do not know why Mithros would kill Sir Alcaster and take the throne without claiming the crown, but... The witches already have a bad name, and he is making it worse. I cannot help but remember the wide smiles Mithros gave me when I was still living in the palace. Every time I felt his eyes on me, I felt there was something strange about him. There was always a cloudiness to his eyes, something unreadable. He was excellent at his job, but always an enigma outside of it. A sudden breeze chills my skin. Let's go back before you freeze out here. Thank you. The two of us begin our walk back to the Marchen. Thoughts of the palace, the king, and my stepfamily cloud my mind. Since I have been staying at the Marchen, I have not seen Rod once. Rod. I was never sure if it was because he was ignoring me, or if it was because he only wanted to speak to Parfait. Regardless, I hope Rod and his family are okay. I would never wish this treatment upon anyone. Not even to ones I hated. As we walk, I glance up at Chevalier, whose head is tilted skyward. I catch the glimmer of lights in his eyes and smile. Even for just a moment, I can forget about everything when I am beside him. He has a way of taking the weight off my shoulders. But as the crown princess, I cannot let others carry my burden for me. I must find ways to protect the others. Even if it means putting myself in danger, or harming someone in order to protect someone else. What do you think is the easiest and fastest way to kill someone? Uh... Chevalier's body goes rigid beside me. He stops to stare at me, wide-eyed. It was a little out of left field, he said. I am asking, just in case I am ever in danger. I... I have never fought anyone before. I can retaliate, but I do not know how to actually harm anyone. To kill someone is to end a life. It is stealing away a life that others might love. You bear the burden of that death for the rest of your life. I pull myself away from him. But Mithras is not an innocent man. Would you rather he kill the royal family instead? No, it's not that, princess. I know he must be stopped at any cost. It's just... I would never want you to have to kill someone. How would you know what it was like to kill someone? You have only ever helped people, not hurt them. You saw the soldiers in the clinic today. You saw how close some of them were to death. Did you see the hollow look in their eyes? I have seen that look many times. It is the look of a man who clings desperately to life. Every life is precious. And a life is still a life, whether it's vile or not. It is still a responsibility you have to bear. I know how valuable and fragile lives are because I have helped so many people. We stand quiet for a few moments, facing each other. I know I am at an odds with Chevalier. He speaks the truth, but I also know that I speak my own version of the truth, too. The world is a place where only the strong survive. People are kind, but they will take advantage of those who are too caring. Bria told me that Chevalier was so selfless he became selfish. She told me that he never had anything because he gave everything to others. His kindness has hurt others, and I fear that it has a likely chance to hurt him as well. What if his reluctance to hurt anyone causes him to be the one that is injured? Chevalier suddenly breaks the silence. Most people think that the easiest way to kill a person is to stab them through the heart. Those people would be wrong. He puts his hand over his heart and stares dismally down at the ground. He removes his hand briefly, but only to reach for mine. Aw, hi there. He takes my hand and settles it on his chest, slightly to the left. I can hear the beating of his heart beneath my palm. It is soft and gentle. You are so tall. <laughs> what can you feel beside the beating of my heart? The... ribs? Yes. In order to stab the heart, you'd have to get through the ribs. That's why most of the soldiers in there who got stabbed in the chest are still alive. If you want to quickly kill someone, you have to stab somewhere where it would be difficult to stem the blood from a wound. Do you have any idea where that might be? 
Um. The neck over the abdomen, I would think. I'm not sure. I'm not. I never did pay attention in biology. The skin on the neck is thinner, and you have lots of blood flow underneath the skin going right to your head. It would most likely be easier to slice or pierce something more vulnerable in the neck without running into as much resistance. Chevalier raises an eyebrow. Did you happen to pick that up around the clinic? No, I simply guessed. I told you I was never very good at biology. Yay! Whew. Maybe I was better than I thought. Then you have a bright mind, princess. Chevalier moves my hand to the side of his neck. My fingers curl slightly when I feel his heartbeat reverberate beneath my fingers. This part is where you can find the jugular vein and the carotid artery. He runs my fingers down the length of it and I shudder. A mischievous smile brightens his face. Not only does cutting at the neck stop blood from going to the head, but it also makes it spurt. If both the vein and the artery are cut, it only takes a minute to bleed to death. Wow. Thus, one of the best ways to kill a person would be through the neck. Why are you telling me all this now? Hmm? I was just enlightening a new pupil with an anatomy lesson. You asked me a question, and I responded as a teacher. Chevalier's fingers loosen on my hand, and I grasp his hand tighter in response. Princess, I don't want you to have to bear the burden of a murder. I promise that I'll protect you, so you don't have to defend yourself with violence. I can't use a sword or magic, and I don't know how to fight, but I will always be there to protect you. I may not have an abundance of muscles beneath these sleeves, but I am a doctor. No one knows the body better than I, so though it may not be heroic, I know how to hurt a person. His sincere expression, though pain, tells me that he is telling the truth. I do not want Chevalier to hurt a person either. It would destroy everything that he has worked toward as a doctor. He has seen so much suffering, and yet always seemed untouched by it. I will do anything I can to protect his positivity. Oh, you too. The marching was quiet when we, re we returned. Everyone had already disappeared into their rooms, and so I went straight to mine. I also forced Chevalier to go back to his. He has been on his feet all day, and he needs the rest. I plopped down onto my bed as soon as we return home. I glanced briefly to the side, where Chevalier's bouquet is in the vase parfait had given to me. Who is it? Parfait. Come in. You've returned. Parfait looks paler than normal. I realized with the start that Chevalier did not tend to her at all today. Don't look at me like that. I'm fine. How were the soldiers at the clinic? Not good. Many of them have been gravely wounded. Some said they remembered magic, others say they did not remember anything at all. A shadow falls over Parfait's expression as she sighs. <sighs> so the circumstances are direer than we thought. It is a good thing Chevalier is there to lend a helping hand. Did you all manage to come up with a plan? It's proving more difficult than we anticipated. Delore and I are willing to put ourselves in danger. Waltz is too because he can use magic to a certain extent. The knights and Karma have their blades. But Chevalier, I do not want to involve him in this. Because you're worried about him. Of course I am. You've grown, princess. You remind me of a younger Hildir. Ugh. Back then, Hildir was both calm and resilient. One moment she could be smiling ear to ear. The next she could be strict and unmovable as the coldest ice. The two of us were like sisters. We did so much together. We learned together, explored the kingdom together. I can say with all certainty that we were the best of friends. And then the fairy tales happened. When Hildir killed the first human, she was corrupted. Her darkness swallowed her whole. I do not remember a time before Mother was corrupted, and so I cannot imagine the woman Parfait describes. I know the old Hildir would have wanted to show you the beauty in things, Princess. She would not want you to suffer. I'm sorry you became so embroiled in things. It was inevitable. If Dolora hadn't cursed me, then I would still be in the palace, and I would be just as helpless as everyone else. So while I am out here, I have the responsibility to help everyone. 
I touch the incomplete glass slipper at my neck. I still haven't even done three good deeds. Don't look so sad. You will complete your three good deeds, and things will go back to normal. And of course, you'll still have friends here when you return. And come your 18th birthday, Delora and I will teach you about magic. Waltz is eager to help, too. But for now, our top priority is a plan. Rest easy, princess. Things will work out. It is hard to believe that this problem could be so easily solved, but I will try to believe. When Parfait leaves, I am left to my own thoughts. I hope everyone at the palace is okay, and that they can hold on until we come up with our plan. But I feel like we are already running out of time. I get that feeling too, girl. Days go by, and I find myself assisting Chevalier at times. Other times I remain at the march to help conceptualize a plan. None of our plans have actually shown any promise yet, but with all of our minds put together we should be able to come up with something. I believe. A week later, I find myself standing outside the clinic door waiting for Chevalier. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Princess. You can drop the title, you know. Lucette, but you are a princess in my eyes. Yes, but you do not need to address me by title. Just my name is fine. Chevalier reaches out to take my hand, then immediately pulls his hand back, eyes wide. Ah, oh, I forgot it. Forgot what? The medicine that I needed for Parfait. Give me a moment, Prin Lucette. Chevalier plants a quick kiss on my forehead before running inside. I get a bad feeling I'm not going to be here <laughs> by the time he gets back. I stare at the stars as I wait. Hmm? I turn, but see no one walking around the plaza. I inch closer toward the door of the clinic as I take another look around. Boo. Ugh! Frickin' Varg. I suddenly see the silhouette of a man. Silhouette of a man! Scaramouche! Scaramouche! He takes a few more steps toward me and then stops in front of me. Yo, it's your boy! I recognize him immediately. His appearance left quite an impression on me the last time. Out at night by yourself. Certainly you know that wolves prowl these streets at night. What do you want? I take a step back and press myself to the door. I reach for the door handle, but the man reaches out a hand to grab my wrist, holding it to the door. Hmm, I'd say my answer to that question is complicated, princess. Uh. By the expression on your face, I must have hit the nail right on the head, eh? You are the princess. How do you know who I am? That is part of the mystery, isn't it? I attempt to wrestle my wrist out of his fingers. Come with me quietly and you won't get hurt. F that crap. I refuse to go anywhere with him. I open my mouth to scream, but before I can even breathe, the man's hand flies to my mouth. You're a disobedient one, aren't you? I struggle against his grasp. It does not take long for the grin to fall from his face. It is replaced with a look that lacks any amusement. I enjoy seeing you struggle, but I'm afraid we've been out here for too long. I bang my shoulder against the door and a resounding creak follows my attempt. Mm. No more, Mr. Nice Guy. The man opens a small vial right in front of my face. Something sweet wafts in the air and I suddenly feel myself falling into darkness as I collapse. No, not again.